So as I mentioned before, what we wanted to do is we wanted to take a look at all devices for use uh, in our classroom, increasingly in our buildings. There is uh, a lack of budgets. Uh, increasingly in our building, budgets are cut. We don't have the tools. We don't have the toys. Um, we all recognize that it's very important for us to play with digital content, and create digital content, and capture photos and images and videos. But some of the challenge is that we don't have the tools to do this. Um, so many times, as educators, we say, oh, well, too bad, so sad. I just don't have the opportunity to use it. When the reality is a lot of our students come into school you know, with devices, and they have the tools. Whether or not the schools will let them use that, that's another talk for another day. But at the very least, we have an opportunity to use devices. And increasingly, mobile devices and cell phones are just getting better and better and better. And so there's a fundamental discussion that starts up around, OK, can I just use my cell phone or my iPad or my tablet and not carry around a nice, big, fancy you know, camera? You know, can I get away with this? So a little while ago, I started hassling Bob and saying, you know, Bob, this is my belief. Like, I think that this is true. Um, and so we started a series of discussions, and Bob basically said, yeah, you can do this, but you have to know what you can and cannot do. Um, so enough land for me, because that's usually a good thing. And what I want to do is get Bob started up. You want me to start your PowerPoint up while you sure. work with people? Give you this. For your patients, why don't we construct the crash of PowerPoint? Technology is overrated. Through an abacus. What's it called? Um, mobile device. Mobile device. Okay, let me explain where I'm coming from. I'm most of my life I've been a freelance photographer for magazines, uh, magazines, newspapers, other things, and. One of the things I had to do is produce quality pictures. They are very sharp. When the world of digital came along, uh, early digital cameras didn't do a really good job of this. Current ones do a phenomenal job. To do that, you need these fairly sophisticated cameras. You need to wind up with these very large files. And we look at these great, lush pictures with a lot of detail, a lot of subtlety. There are a lot of elements to it. It's not just the number of pixels. So that's part of it. So for me, the idea of working with devices like the phones was not even a consideration. They just did not fit. They were fun. Take pictures around the house, take pictures of the cat, or whatever you see. But there was always something wrong because they knew it wasn't going to be part of the standards. Well, they just to go back, and while I do always shot for the highest quality for the magazine if you needed it, um, I wasn't the person who believed that everything had to be sculpted to perfection because that's not the way the real world is. That, but with the publication of print, you do need a lot of pixels and a lot of files and a camera. As things moved along, uh, small point shoot cameras came out with better quality lenses for film, and they were pretty good. They weren't as good as a fancy camera, but you could use them. Uh, the technology got better, the development of the lenses got better. Um, our film was the same, so we're creating images that were still good. Digital comes along, there aren't any pixels, and it isn't just about pixels, it's about bringing out detail. And they just weren't there, and it got better and better and better. Um, it's amazingly good today. But um, today there are a lot of different ways to use this and approach it. And one of the biggest differences to keep in mind is there's a huge difference in how, when you want to use picture to print it on paper or someone on some kind of output, or on a monitor or projected on the screen. Um, they, um, they're created or they're put together very, very differently. It comes down from the same file, but if you're going to work only electronically, only projected, only use it on the internet, only use it on a monitor, you have 
tremendous amounts of flexibility, far more than you'd ever um, have in the print media. I'm going to explain why. So I got more and more interested in how to use um, digital, and digital art presented a lot of new opportunities, um, even for the magazine work. It changed the way we did things very fundamentally. Um, and I'm going to talk about that a little bit. But one of the things I started to realize is you can pick up these devices, a very sophisticated digital camera, and if you've ever picked one up, there are a million menus and they're really confusing. Have you ever dealt with one that's really frustrating? Even with one you can, it's kind of really irritating. They have too many things going on. Um, you have this sort of embarrassment of choices. Um, and a few people can use every aspect of it. So I started to realize with my high-end cameras that I need to figure out what I need and learn how to do that. And otherwise, I'm just going to be overwhelmed. And I realize I'm coming, coming to a time where you spend all your time learning how to use the tools, but never get time to use them. <laughs> um, so I think, what is it I want to do? What can it do? What do I want to do? Then I started to explore what you call the, the less sophisticated devices, the less sophisticated in terms of the output of the photo file. Um, including phones. And one of the things I realized is there are things they do and there are things they don't do. And the way to get the most out of them is to know that. If you try to get anything, any camera, into balance, any tool to do everything, you're eventually going to be disappointed. So I started to realize that if I got to know what it can do and I thought about what I wanted to do, I could get it to do a heck of a lot. And I've been pretty impressed. I'm still on a learning curve. But I'm um, now using an iPhone 5, and I can get pretty amazing things. And I'm still trying to figure out quite all the words. Remarkable. So what I came to realize is you can get a heck of a lot out of your device, whether it's a phone, an inexpensive point-shoot camera, or a sophisticated one, by figuring out what you want to do, what your device can do, and what do you need to know to do it? And you can sort of take control. It's kind of like a car. Do you go in and just put it on gas? No, you can right? Um, and that's the way the phones work. So a point shoot camera, and that's what phone is in a way. We'll just have a picture and get a picture. But I think we've all been pretty disappointed with pictures at times, right? They don't all work out. Um, and they won't all work out. But half of a lot more of them can work out if you just take some time to learn a little bit about the device. It doesn't mean it's a complicated thing. Um, so what I decided to do today, Nanny um, and I were talking, there were so many things we talked about. We talked about uh, phone, we talked about point shoot camera, we talked about video, we talked about software for after the fact work. What I decided to do was to show you some of what I did with just my iPhone. Um, it was a lot of fun for me, by the way. I never put it together. I just care for 5,000 pictures. They're mostly pets and stuff, but it's more fun, right? Um, <laughs> But I've also started to explore what else I can do with it. And I want to show you, because I think you'll find that you can, you can get ahead a lot more, and it's just a little bit a uh, matter of asking some questions. Um, can you them yep. Go all of them off? Yeah, why not? We'll yep. see if I I didn't do much to fix these, uh, adjust the pictures. OK, some of these, by the way, I want to bring uh, putting this together so I got dragged into um, Keynote and a PowerPoint presentation, and they didn't be sidetracked. This is a vertical that I didn't want to take time to put back together. So, this was just I was uh, wearing a friend's plants one day, and I noticed the light coming in the window. Um, and look how the light really makes the flowers look pretty. It gives you nice highlights and shadows, got a bit of a reflection. The first thing to do, if anybody wants to take better pictures, whatever camera you use, is think about the composition. Think about it. It is really the fastest way to cover a lot of ground. Years ago, some friends contacted me. They were going off on a nature conservancy trip to the end of South America. They had a kind of fairly simple camera. And they said, can you send clues? Our pictures are never come out so great. What can we do? Well, we literally sat down for under two hours now and had not talked about composing. We weren't going to learn anything technical. They can have some really nice pictures. Because the camera did a pretty good job with the exposures, but they just started to think about where things were in the frame. So the first thing is, look, think about the picture, think about the frame, where is everything in relationship to each other? Is your picture straight if you want it to be straight? Um, here, I was also looking at the light. So notice how the light is defining your subject. The light's coming in the window, 
create a bit of a reflection, some more greenery outside. Compose it carefully and look at the light. Right there, your picture will get better. I promise you. Um, we can talk for days about the composition, but what looks nice? If you take a picture of somebody and they're near a lamppost, you want growing out of their head, or would you rather it was next to them? <laughs> Think about things like that. We've all done it, though, haven't we? <laughs> of course we have. Um, and just notice it in the landscape. Should everything be in the middle? No, if you take a picture of, I don't know, a cow in the field, you don't want it in the middle. You just want it a little lower, and then the field, and the fence in the front. So start to think about composition. That works on any um, Pictures will look better. So, um, where are we here? Let's go from the keyboard. So just notice what's going on. The cat's sitting there. The light is coming in the window. Windows are great sources of light. They're like a flash or a lamp. Or but notice things, cats move around, dogs move around, children move around. Um, so think about the light, think about where you put the elements of the picture, when something looks nice. You've all seen the picture, notice the light is in the window and it's nice and warm, especially late in the day, things look nice. Uh, she's sweet. She spoke in for that one. Oh, she's got to She knows she's got to be around her phone. <laughs> Over the side, the light from getting there. Sometimes it's bright and harsh, but it takes a little bit of an overcast day. So it, it wasn't that big a difference. When you compose carefully, and you know what? You do it a few times, you'll learn. And you'll learn faster with digital because you'll see the results right away. So take a picture, just come out, move over a little bit more. Look at it. Why is it not so good? When she turned her head, it was perfect. So just playing around like that, and I know that's not really different between. Uh, a phone and, and a, an SLR, but I want to encourage you to start by exploring this. Everything I'm going to do, try it. You'll learn a lot more by doing it than uh, just remembering what I said. <laughs> just notice how they're about 3,000, maybe 4,000. <laughs> I get teased about this, but she's always cute, and I never bothered to bring off the phone. Uh, so you just have a lot of fun and see what happens when you do it differently. When I started working with the phone, since I didn't know what it was going to do, I was kind of in your boat. I had to experiment and learn what would work. And once you get to know your tool, whether it's a phone or a point your camera, you'll get better. The camera will go pretty close. If this is just a plain old iPhone. I did nothing to these pictures. I outputted them. There are one or two that I did one or two little things, and I'll tell you, these are straight from the camera. And by the way, the first rule of digital from the photography perspective is all digital benefits from a little bit of tweaking. Always needs a little sharpening. Your phone is actually doing some of that for you, but there's nothing wrong with doing a little bit of adjusting. Um, even from a journalist perspective, which is how I come with, that's not manipulating. That's sort of the developing process. Um, so start, but start to think about it. So I experimented with the phone. How close would it let me go? What did I have to learn about it? Well, first thing I learned is lens is a bit of a wide-angle lens. So you've all seen wide-angle lenses taking big views and telephoto lenses that zoom in, you get a bird, you know, two yards away. Well, it's not a telephoto lens. So the first thing I learned is it's not for photographing small birds that are 100 yards away. So if I don't do that, I won't be disappointed. It's a wide-angle lens. It's a little bit of a wide-angle lens. So that means if I get closer, I can, I'll get a little bit of this wider effect. I can take in a room. So there is one of the first lessons. Don't try to do something you can't do. You're not going to get a picture. So I don't use it to try to photograph birds 100 yards away. But I start experimenting with how close I can get. What perspective? Does it distort? Not really. It does a nice job. It's pretty sharp. And then I think about your composition a bit. Well, let's talk about that. Notice in the picture the cat's pretty sharp. The background's out of focus. You've all seen pictures like that. So there are pictures where everything's in focus. There are pictures where selected parts of it, like the range of things from the main subject. Um, the term we use for that is depth of field. How much of the area is in focus? And here you can see the foreground subject, the cat's in focus, the background is out of focus. OK. What if the background went in focus and the cat was out of focus? My camera, I just control the focus. But what happens on the phone? Well, the phone pretty much does it for us, so I thought. So hold that thought for another picture. But I want you to think about this idea of what's in focus. Here's another example. 
Okay, now the background's in focus, X tail is not. So I composed it, have it moving its tail around, we got this nice little moment. Um, but I learned how I could make my phone focus where I wanted to. I didn't know it could do that. And what I discovered is with the iPhones, and I think many others, it will focus on the spot where you put your finger. So when I was setting up the picture, I put my finger on where the cat was, and it focused right past the tail to her. So now I was taking control. I kind of like that. Um, it will actually do two things. It will focus where you tell it, and it will adjust the brightness of the darkness, the exposure, for the area you suggest. Well, not perfect, but a pretty good job. So right now, with one little of my finger, I'm changing the um, exposure, how bright or how dark my subject is, and I'm just changing what's in focus. And that's you can create these kind of artsy type photos. Um, or if I just if I had just taken this picture, by the way, the camera would have focused on the closer subject. So I would have had the tail, uh, and I probably would have been blurred, and I wouldn't have had her. And so that's not how I can make this do some of the things I can do my make my radio camera do. Um, Think about you know, coming down my driveway one day and um, <coughs> the four foot flex, it's harmless. It's kind of cute. Um, so I can just put my camera down at an angle. One of the things you can do with the phone is when you take out your picture, take a picture, your camera's up there. So you can flip it around and that way you can get a nice angle. You can still see your screen. That's really easy and convenient. So I would hold it like that, press the area that I want, and then take my picture. And that's all that went into that. I didn't have to get that close to it. Um, so you can do a lot. And I, this one's a, unfortunately a vertical guy, but, but one of the things I carefully did is I didn't put his head in the middle, so I had just the right way here, put the head sort of towards the bottom, and it kind of wiggles back there and goes into the bushes it was coming out. So very simple, just instead of doing this and having to go all the way down, flipped it over, got down, I could see it kind of nicely, that was pretty easy, shows where I wanted it to focus, and um, I like it, that's nice and easy. And by any time there are any questions, please just jump in. I said that all digital um, requires some adjustment. There's sometimes pictures that you need to adjust because the lighting was difficult. So this was done on a stage. The light was very harsh, very bright areas, very dark areas. So I just went into one of my programs and made a little bit of an adjustment. One of the things that happens is our eyes correct. Our brains are very smart. And they correct. So when we're, if you're sitting in the audience watching this, you would see all the details on her. You would see all this, but you'd also see a lot of details in the dark here. Our eyes correct. We take multiple pictures. You're doing it right now. If you're looking and you're seeing me and you're seeing stuff outside the window, camera can't do it. If you took a picture of me and I was uh, good exposure, you could see me, that would be pure white light. Picture of that, I would be at this whole room would be pitch black. Cameras can't see that range of light to dark that we can. And that's, we have a term for that. It's called the dynamic range, the difference from light to dark. You don't have to do anything with it, but you have to know that all cameras, film, digital, have a limitation. So while I was seeing her very clearly, plus the books very clearly, this is what my phone was seeing. Um, so I fixed it a bit. Um, how much can you fix? That depends. It depends on the type of camera, the type of file. But just know that you can often get more out of your picture with a very simple adjustment. And now there's lots of software for it. So that's another tool in your arsenal. Here's an issue with the cameras. We've all seen pictures where you stop the action, somebody's jumping, a basketball shot, somebody's not in the basket. That's done with a thing called the shutter speed. Cameras all have a little shutter. It's a little thing that that opens and closes briefly to take the picture. Sometimes it's, whether it's film or digital, this little curtain opens and closes. And the faster it opens and closes, the more action it stops. So one of the things that photographers are very conscious of is adjusting the shutter speed on our big cameras so that we can stop motion if something's in motion. This is something you cannot do, cannot handle on your phone. For the most part, you don't have access to that control. Um, and I say for the most part, because there is third-party software, there are apps that actually work their way into. Um, and some phones may be starting to allow it. Certainly the iPhones don't. Um, so one of the things that I think about when I'm working with my camera is it's not going to let me adjust the shutter speed. 
So the way the shutter speed works is a faster brief shutter speed will stop action. But that requires more light. So if I'm outside, it's a really bright sunny day, and this guy was doing this, I would have got a faster shutter speed and stopped the action. Inside, the shutter slows down. So the one thing I had to know was things that are moving indoors are going to get blurry. Um, so I thought I shot the picture with that in mind. You can see everybody else is nice and sharp, but he was very animated. So I thought that could be part of the picture. With a professional digital camera, I would control it, but when I got to know how to use my camera, I could still get what I thought was a pretty neat picture, because this was really the way he was as an artist when he at the gallery opening over at the UNH campus, and he was very animated. Um, so the fact that he was still, it would not have been, I thought, a typical picture. But if you want somebody still, you get them when they're moving less. So notice here, he's not moving his body as much, but he's moving his hands. So if you become aware of what's moving and what's not, you can actually control whether the subjects are in focus or not, or whether they're sharp. Like my cat, for example. Uh, indoors, she moves. If I catch her when she's still, I'll get the sharp picture. Otherwise, I'll get her in motion. Sometimes the motion can be nice. I like it. I like it in this picture. But be aware of it. So if you're trying to take pictures indoors and you have kids running around and the lights aren't very bright, they're going to get blurry. Turn on more lights. Um, catch them when they stop for a moment. You know how the sports photographers get those great basketball dunking shots? There are two ways. Sometimes you use these bright flashes that freeze the action. But more than that, more often, they think about what's going on. So if somebody's going up to dunk a basket, they're moving, right? Pretty fast? What happens when you go up and you're getting ready to go down? Stop. And they catch that moment. So if you're jumping up, think about it. You jump up. No matter how fast you're going, you're going to slow down and stop before you come in. You can't be going in two directions at once. And that's what the photographers look for. They look for those moments when people are not in them. So if I'm talking like this, at some point, my hands stop. That's the most time you get less much. Um, and with the cameras, that's very important, especially in your work. And once again, think about your composition. And notice the light. Usually when you have photography inside and outside, it can be difficult. This was just a bright day where the light was really strong. There's absolutely nothing done to this picture. Just look at the light and say, oh, that's going to really work out nicely. If you start to notice it, your brain will just say, that's right. Light was even. It's not much brighter inside or outside. Having some white rug here kind of helped it brighten things up. The light was on the cat's face. So you can notice that there's not a big difference. If inside was much darker, it wouldn't have worked out. So you can get these pictures that look like they're more elaborate when they're, sorry, when they're not by just noticing the light, noticing the composition. Imagine if the cat had his face in a different direction, he might not have liked it as much, but his face was up, the light was on his face. Um, and that's all there was to it. Okay, I'm sorry these got clipped, but I wanted to show you how simple you can your camera will work if you work carefully with it. There are a couple of flowers that I passed by a couple of days ago. Um, and I thought the light looked nice on them. Look at the detail. I did absolutely nothing to them. I held my camera very steady. And you, the closer you get to something, the more you see movement. So think about it. If you're, if you're back in the, in the back of the room, can you see me moving my hand? Probably not much. But I am moving it. If you're right in front of it, it's going to look a lot more pronounced. So when you want to do something like this, hold it really steady. Pose it carefully. Notice the light. Um, and the pictures will be nice and sharp. And I did poke my finger right at the flower, so I told the camera where to focus. Here's an example of another picture I took right after that one. But notice a slight difference. Oops, I in the wrong order. Sorry. So this is the original. And I just gave it a little sharpening, a little extra contrast. See how it jumps out more? Uh, sharpness is sometimes perceptual. <clears throat> Things look sharper when there's dark and light, when it's all light. It won't look as sharp. Lightness tends to infiltrate the edges of lines. So I added a little contrast. I added a little sharpness. And the picture jumped out more. And you got a real perception of sharpness. Yes. Did you do that on the phone or on the computer? I did that on the computer. OK. Um, that is a very good question. There is a lot of software, and I'm still exploring it. I've, used, I've tried the software, a uh, little few controls that come with the iPhone. And I don't like them because you don't have a lot of control over them. 
I prefer the program, I'm using a fairly sophisticated one, but even a basic one that lets you choose the amount of adjustment. Um, I think it's all you really need. So if you have um, Max using iPhoto, we more than do it. Even though I don't overly like that program, it's perfect for this. Uh, there are tons of free programs for phones, and I'm still exploring those. I don't have one to recommend. But as long as you have a bit of control, what I don't like about the uh, iPhone control is you press it and say, do you like it? There are one or two choices you can make, but they're, they're usually not very pleasing. So, yeah, and these are not radical controls. These are not, you know, you're not going to Photoshop for this, that's for sure. So, good, great question. So, here we uh, did some colleagues at a conference, and I told them to jump. <laughs> and that's what you get. That's kind of what we wanted. If I was using my fancy camera, I would have frozen them in midair, but um, I would throw them time. What about the flash? So, a flash is a short burst of light. Your traditional flash on a camera is this very, very quick burst of light that can freeze motion. Anybody ever seen the famous picture of a bullet going through an apple? Or a classic picture? That was shot with a flash that did a burst of light at one millionth of a second. John the labs at MIT. It's very cool. But even the whole flash, you pop up flash you have on most point your camera, it's a short burst of light. That'll stop a lot of motion. The flashes on the newer um, phones are not the same kind of light. They're LEDs. And even though it looks like a burst of light, the same kind of burst of light, it's not. It's a longer burst of light. So it won't stop action. It will It will allow blurring. So one of the things a lot of people who use cameras will be up oh, pop the flash and that'll stop things from moving. It doesn't work that way on your phone. So your phone flash will add light, but it won't stop motion. Um, this. this is not focus because she's cute. This is about controlling your um, what's in focus. So notice these two. So here, the paw is a little bit out of focus. I focus on her face. Now I shifted the focus to the paw, and the face is done just by touching it. Which is better? It's up to you. It depends on your picture. But here's something worth knowing. When you have something in the point of focus, the point of things where you focus, a certain area in front and behind that point will be in focus too. It will vary. Most of it is behind. So if I focus on her face, I have much less chance of her paw being in focus. Because on paw, a little more of her face will get in focus. So most uh, extra focus is behind the point you choose. So that's a way you can use your camera very effectively. And by the way, it's the same with the point shoot camera. It's usually a little square that it focuses on. Tell it where you want to go. It controls it. Here's an example of the paw versus the face. You make a very different picture. And then I gave her the dark part of her face another tap, and that lightened up my whole picture. So a couple little taps to take control. Once again, just a few changes, tariffs and changes. She's a hand, huh? She's a total hand. Very spoiled there. And she's also a convenient subject. Um, well, here's an example of a difficult situation. We're in a plane. The uh, plane is very dark. There's a student on the project. Well, here's what the camera did at first, because it saw this bright light coming in. And actually, this is a pretty nice picture. But if I wanted to see more of him, I would tap on him, and it would make the whole picture lighter. Which is right. That's up to you. But part of what I want to do is sort of enable you to get the pictures you want to get. Here's an example of light coming in. Look at the difference. Red white wall, that would have been the first exposure. This would have been the first exposure. And then I wanted the dog to the cat to show, so I tapped on them and it lightened the whole picture. So it may not be a wonderful picture, but I can see them now. Here's an example of how the camera will see. So it was one of those three pictures. This is the engineering building over at UNH. And I stood next to the building in these cool clouds about three days ago, and I looked up. And because the cloud was so much brighter, it darkened the picture. Um, and the building's name is a bit dark. Then I tapped on the clouds. I'm sorry, now I tapped on the front of the building, so it lightened the building, but the clouds went away. Well, all of our cameras, pretty much all of them, have a feature called high dynamic range. Have you heard of it? HDR? HDR it expands that dynamic range. It gets, it allows you to take pictures 
and have more detail in the bright and the dark areas. And the way it does it, it literally takes multiple pictures and it samples them. Um, and I just press that button on my camera, and I got this picture, which is using the clouds and the building. Um, there are complicated ways you can do this with um, the digital SLRs, but this is pretty good. I just press, poke that, and it started doing it. You need to be fairly still. You need to be subject to be fairly still, but you know, clouds move a little bit. Um, so understand this idea that not the things that are very bright and things that are very dark may not all show well in a picture um, is one of the things you should keep in mind and know you have this tool called high dynamic range you push the button and all those details will show. I'm running through this quick, somewhat quickly because I want to just introduce a couple of areas and then just sit down and learn how to play with these. I want to show you the kind of details. The painting that a friend uh, did and I went up with my camera. Cameras are pretty clear, pretty sharp. But there are toys you can get to do even more. So um, all cameras can only focus so close. You ever take a picture and you're too close and everything's out of focus? Well, with professional cameras, we add things called close-up lenses or macro lenses. They're now extra little toys you can buy for your phone. And I have a little $12 or $14 set of close-up lenses. It's a combination of close-up. And by the way, this is the difference between just adding a little sharpening. It gets that much better. Here's an example of, well, probably the next tool. This is a close-up picture of the cat's eye, and you can kind of see, this is my lens here. You can see me reflect in it, it's pretty good, it's pretty sharp. Now I went into my program and I lightened the dark areas. There are pretty simple ways to do that. And I wanted to show you this because you'll notice it has a sort of model feel. Um, we have two things going on there, two types of what's called noise. When you take pictures, especially of dark things in low light, you get this speckling, this modeling, and you also get some colors. This is called noise. It's just a function of pushing your camera to take pictures in very, very low light. One of the reasons it can be worth learning a little bit about some basic software is there are controls to get rid of that. So, is it in the right order? Actually, it should have been that one. Sorry. That one, and then that one. And that one. But just you can see you have progressions of what you can, can adjust and improve. The other two I came with my uh, little set of lenses was a fisheye lens. Um, this whole thing was like $12. <laughs> and it's pretty darn good. It's kind of a lot of fun. If you're working with kids and want to play around, this stuff is great. This is the kind of thing, the picture you get with a fish eye. So it exaggerates, it makes things closer, look bigger, creates this sort of bubble look. Um, it can be pretty sharp. Right, I'm actually just putting it all together. And here's a set of pictures that show you how you control your depth of field, even with that. So I move the depth of field from the person to the foot. So you can have fun with it, you can play with it. Have I turned it, I flipped the thing around to a close-up picture. Um, so one of the things that's great, if you're working with kids, you can have a blast. You can have fun with this stuff. <laughs> Be creative. The first thing I tell some of my students is you don't just stand there. Bend down, look up, look down, turn around. And the phone is so easy because you can twist it. Um, so the, uh, the camera has to fall down and get under the cat. You just slide it under and kind of look. Sometimes I flip, if I want to do a picture like this, I'll flip it to the front of the phone. Uh, camera. You know there aren't many pixels. Let's look at the picture. Oh, that's a cat's name. Oh. It's not that pixel. Okay, here, here's the English major. Something it's not the camera pixel. It's the old word pixelated. You remember this word? It means possessed by pixels and then send her to the little nuts. <laughs> <laughs> so there's a little pun in there. Poor cat. Uh. It's just like coming in the window. Yeah, I want to show you what it can do. Straightforward pictures, elegant pictures, but look at the light. You notice how they want texture. Um, some people think when they oh, the light should be even. But portrait light very often isn't, and it's this texture, it's the highlights and shadows that make it look sharp. If the light was just hitting her right in the face, it would fill in the shadows, just the sharp, but it wouldn't look as sharp. So it's this contrast, it's this detail that make it look sharp. I did not touch this picture. Right out of the camera. 
Here I used the flap, so she wasn't moving, but it added a little light. Look how it gave it a little surreal feel. It adds a little light, it's often like a little bit of warmth to it, like a little red or yellow. Um, but it filled in her eyes and made it bright. Well, creepy. But you have to use a flash very carefully on the camera. It's not very controllable. But practice. I had no idea how to use it until I just started using it. Okay, I don't use it much, but once in a while, it's pretty nice. One of the things that poems do in perspective. So, close the door in my office, and she tries to get into a little space. <laughs> and I get this <laughs> and I thought that's hysterical. That's, that's scary. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's actually, um, this got inspired by a YouTube of a mailman trying to deliver mail, and a cat's paw coming to a slot in the door <laughs> and going at it. And you find this, it's hysterical. And I noticed she was doing it. It's really creepy. Isn't it? And then I thought, okay, I've got to try to get a picture of it. It looks like about a space like this. I couldn't get down with my camera. My camera lens is like this. This lens is really small. So I just put it down on the floor like this. And there she is. So this has a perspective that my big camera couldn't do. It could get into place. So it's put this under the right right over there. That's the whole and it makes that space look really large and it focuses right on her. And I thought it was pretty darn funny. So one of the things I've discovered is this is the places I can't get into them. I can't get my head down there. And then you have a panorama feature. You've probably all seen that. Panorama is a wide sweeping view. So with the iPhone, I would just put it over here, I would start clicking and move around, it does a panorama. It's a lot of fun. Um, you can use it like this. I just went up to the Costco one day and, and did this. I did tweak the lights a little bit because one end near the front door was brighter, it was darker, but very, very little. And it instantly creates this panoramic view. As I used it, I realized it's far from perfect. Because if things are moving, they get distorted. And I thought that was just great. So the oh that was the before and the after. So that's why I'm learning one or two controls to know. It's very wide, so it creates a distortion. This was a stupid Why did you do it that wide? I took the camera to do a panorama, you actually move it and then it records the image. Um, if you literally, you. Um, the, the, the one of us? We'll do one we can watch. But the cameras are we'll set up to. The traditional way of doing it was taking several pictures and putting them together. There were some special cameras that actually did these wide stretch pictures. This actually records as you move the camera into one still image. And that's a standard feature on the iPhone. On, on current iPhones, and several generations, and many, many phones. And actually, even many point shoot cameras today. But it has a problem. Um, if I did this in several pictures, well, they will be still. If you're moving, you might walk in and out of different pictures. And I thought, well, that's kind of cool. So it starts to distort a little bit. And then I noticed, well, this kid starts to move and he's a little distorted. And I thought, well, this is better. So. Mm -hmm. And I actually get people ask people to deliberately move. Oh, it gets really weird. So see, she kind of walked in as I was hitting that part of it. So these people were pretty still, and we got past them. But it does create bits of distortions. You what you can do is you can have a person at the end, and as you take the picture, it runs on to the other end and take a picture in both places. Absolutely. One thing that students do with um, Photoshop is they will photo merge. You can get multiple pictures and we'll put them together. So if you stand really still, you do one, you do, and I have the person have to move so they get a picture. I actually done with people not walking past the library or the school. I'll stand there and I'll do the one picture. I wait till they move. So I get the same person in all the pictures. And if you really want to be silly with those, you get them walking towards each other on two sides. <laughs> so yeah, you can have a great time. It's, it's a license to be silly. Um, so then I thought, let's go further. So I, I did this actually in the car while I was driving. Um, and so yeah, I moved it a little bit. So the car is moving, things are moving. Maybe I'm starting to wiggle it around a little bit. But anyway, here's a traditional, a simple traditional one done on a boat a week or so on 4th of July. And I just have caught the light, got a little bending. But I was moving shoes, which never had to be. It's indoors, so there's a lot of uh, noise distortion, but I didn't touch this picture. I can actually clean up the distortion if I want. And now what I'm trying to do is take control of it and really get it over Sitting around the table at dinner, kind of wiggle again. It's not a manipulated picture. It's a maneuvered phone. 
turned it upside down part way around. The phones, there are different things that some will allow you to do and some won't. Some can tell if you turned it around and it will stop. Um, I want you to see though, you know, work your angle and get a nice picture. This is in the same low light. But then you can move around so the cat was just on a rug. Isn't that weird, right? Hmm. And I'll admit, I, I have ideas of how this works, but I'm still learning it, learning the effect. So think about it. The more you do it, the more you learn what will give you the kind of effect you like. So you can have a lot of fun. So That's cool. Whether you want to do, produce quirky, funky pictures, or whether you want to take control of what's in focus, or whether you want to take control of what's light and what's dark, Learning a couple of things will make the phone incredibly more versatile and valuable than it was before you did that. You can get things to repeat themselves, which I think is kind of cool. So that, those are the effects. And now I want to talk about it and also talk about how you can use these devices in ways that are really spectacular, especially if you're only going to use them electronically. This is really important. Because Ian brought up a point. He said, you know, a lot of people don't want to do things, you can't do things in class, because they don't have the resources, right? You can't buy a kid's camera. They're expensive. Well, you might not need fancy cameras. Everybody, anybody here own a digital camera? Mm -hmm. What are one of the main selling points of features in the What's one of the first they tell you? Oh, yeah, sure. What, what do you, when you see a camera, they tell you how many megapixels usually you need? So mega is for millions, or how many millions of pixels? Um, how many do you need? You can do that. You all want to buy these cameras. I bought a 36 megapixel camera. It's fantastic for what I do. Do you need 36 megapixels? How many megapixels do you need? Why do we want bigger ones? More always better. Like a you know, remember the movie Super Size This? Is that what it's all about? We were talking about the other day. So this is a little Casio. You know, XLIM, 7.2 megapixels. This is basically because we have our cell phones, we never use this. Right. You know, this sits in my, I looked at it one day and I'm like, my phone does 64 mega or whatever. I'm like, we don't need this. So my son plays with it. You know, it sits in a drawer. You know, we don't use it. You know, yeah, I have some in my classroom. I can't get more. And if you're going to make a print for your wall, you're going to need a certain number of pixels. You need more pixels. But when you look at it on the screen, you don't need it anymore. So here's one of the strange. Anybody, uh, anybody familiar with the idea of how pictures are made of pixels? Um, very briefly, they're tiny, tiny, tiny dots. All pictures are made of tiny dots. Look at an old magazine, you can kind of see the little dots. And when dots get close enough, the colors or the tones blur, and we see what we call continuous tone image. But anything, pick up the cover of the books, anything. All pictures are printed as a series of dots. Because uh, when a printer puts out the ink, it's one, one color at a time. And it blends, and they actually blend. So a little of this, a little of that. And that's how your picture is made. Your picture is made up of these tiny dots. So if you have a 10 megapixel camera, you have approximately 10 million dots of these different colors. And when they get close to each other, they blend and they look continuous. So if I'm making a good print to put on my wall, how many dots do I need? Well, the bigger the picture, the more dots. OK. Let's say I want to make a picture that's 8 inches by 10 inches. So let's just 10 inches. Generally, a good print requires between 250 to 300 dots for each inch. So if you're on 10 inches, you need 10 times that, so 2,500 to 3,000 little dots little pieces necessary to make a nice, 8 by 10 inch print on the ten side. Ten side. When you look at a picture on a monitor, pictures you look on the screen, even though they look just as sharp, they we see they're projected differently and we see them differently. You only need about 72 pixels per inch. Well, it's 72 that's in the standard. So 72 versus say 250. And that's three and a half times it. You don't need as many pixels to get a really good image. So if you're going to use your pictures on the internet, you're going to show them to the kids, you don't need my 36 million pixel camera. This 7 million pixel camera is overkill. You can get one of these old ones for like the 3 megapixels that everybody's throwing away. They're not worth 10 cents. 
and they'll work for you going. Are the newer cameras better in other ways? Sure, they'll reproduce cell tones and light and dark better, better range of tone. Does that really matter? No, you just want to show them and get nice pictures. So get the cameras that people are throwing away. They will really work just as well. The pictures you saw on the screen were a maximum, maximum on the long side of 1,600 pixels. So based on 250 pixels per inch, I could only do, what, five and six inches. The computer's a lot bigger picture than this, and then it'll chart. If I printed that file, that size, it would just be a mess of dots. It just wouldn't be able to it. But it electronically is viewed differently. It's just a different function. So you don't need all those things. So you can use these cameras that are less expensive. I have small cameras. I don't even know. I can go one minute. They're not really on each slide, but there are plenty for doing things um, like that. So you can have a lot of fun. You can get stuff for kids, um, and probably get most of it for free. The other thing is, if you happen to have these big files, there's something else you can do. I can take my big files, and have a big picture of what's going on, and take one little part of it. If I took that one little part and printed it, it would blow up in a very pixelated great part. But electronically, it would still look pretty good because I only need 72 pixels per inch. PowerPoint maxes out at something like 1600, so there's no point in that. And if I did that at 1200 instead of 1600, you would notice the difference. Um, so while I do like to have the best quality for what I'm doing, for this, this is the right quality. So you have a lot of potential. Um, can it get too small? Sure. There's some silly little you know, cameras that are very very, very low resolution, and they're going to be too small. Um, one thing you should be careful about when you set your camera, make sure you're setting it for the right number of pixels. There's some that are, you can set for thumbnails, and that won't be good. But if you learn a little bit about your tools, you have more tools than you ever realized. My oldest phone, I would never use it today. But you know what? Just in printing, I couldn't, but just to show people and use with kids, that would be fantastic. Little point and shoot. Like I said, I have some codex that still I can't get rid of. I gave them to my photo club. They don't want them. Because they can buy much better cameras for probably $50. And I just don't want it. But if you're going to use them electronically, they're just fine. So learning a bit about your tools will give you a heck of a lot of flexibility. Um, if you wanted to do something where you need parts, I can take a picture of you guys on my camera, which is 36 megapixels and take out each of your heads separately, and they'll look fine, because I have so many pixels. But do you really need that all the time? Probably not. You want to get the kids out to be creative. Simple is better. Simple is better. Just learn how to take control of your, your tool. What can it do? What can't it do? What do I want it to do? And what do I need? Too often we shoot for the fancy toys. Um, I learned early in my career as a photographer, I couldn't afford a lot of fancy toys. Bought by some wonderful photographers, and I'm going out in the field, but the equipment's really expensive. And there was an older photographer who had a studio with phenomenally expensive equipment. He got tired of it. He said, you know what, I can make stuff you like it. And he started making a lot of the little extra things we use. And I looked a little bit like the junkyard photographer. But those pictures work. Those pictures, you can make it work. Is it important to sometimes have the rest of it? Sure. But you can do a lot with a lot less if you learn how it works. And we'll leave you on that one, and we'll talk some more about what your equipment is like. And I started out, one of my specialties was still is on work about it. It's a pretty equipment intensive world. It can be very complex. And the equipment is pretty expensive. And there used to be a wonderful, a simple little housing you could buy, housing you put your Nikon camera and go underwater. And most of them were a couple of thousand dollars. It was a basic plastic one for $150. That's how I started. Was it good? Okay. Was it as good as the other? No. What made it less good? Well, one thing that made it less good, slightly, was the port in front, the thing you shoot through, was a little lower quality, but not much. Everything else had to do with convenience, how easily the controls were. Remember, same camera, same lens, same film. And I met this wonderful, very well-known, still well-known, water photographer. And he heard what I was doing. He was one of the National Geographic's top photographers. And he can't. Because he knew the photographer. I'm going to go down. I can't. I can't do any of that. 
And the problem is magazine would probably shouldn't be picture shop. Because it's the same calendar, the same lens. All I had, so I made it work. And I'm going to still use those pictures. So it's sometimes you do need specialties of doing it, but very often you don't. Figure out what you need to do. Using the same lens, same area. So just figure out how to it was more awkward. It took more effort. I couldn't take as many pictures. But it's the picture. Once I learned what I needed, I learned to look at the light, I learned to like my subject, right? And I could do that. Was I happier when I got my fancy house? You bet. Much easier. But that doesn't mean you can't. So don't feel limited if you can't get the big fancy dress. Um, you can do a lot. And there are a lot of wonderful little extras you can get yourself. And I brought some to show you. But I thought I'd stop for a minute and ask quite, give some kinds of questions, and I'll show you some little toys you can get. Um, everything probably you're coming up. Um, well, so what is the, um, how many made it? I'm going to get it. I don't have a data on it. Get it on. Um, this but one, the 5 is 8. Is the 5S um, higher? The 5C rather? No, I think it's all the same. So <coughs> it's the camera and the, and the capabilities on a phone. How does the iPhone compare to, like, a Samsung Galaxy? Or, do you know no, it's any better? Know. I know. Ian, you have which one? I have the Note. Um, it does a, re a relatively good job. Um, you know, I mean, most of the phones are pretty decent now. The the Windows phones, the Lumias, have great uh, cameras on them. I think you really can't. Right now, the gold standard is the uh, the iPhones. The iPhones have just been really, really good for a while. Um, the Samsungs are nice. The thing I don't like about it is they put so much like bloat and cruft wear on it that it's hard to make sense of it. Well, the extra apps you mean? Yeah, they put on my phone, you know, I would rather just be able to take a picture and it works and it works well. Whereas the Samsung that I have, it has a gigantic phone on it. I mean, it has a gigantic camera, but the issue is that it's like uh, they have like golf mode and then this mode and then that mode. And I'm like, I don't care mode. Like, I, I, I want to push the button and I want to be able to take a picture of my son running and playing. That's all I want it to do. And you take a picture and it just doesn't look right or it focuses on the wrong thing and it can just be hugely annoying. So, what those modes them? do is they adjust yeah. to what they think is right for that mode. So, most points of time have a cloudy day mode. Like, what does that mean? But well, what happens on a cloudy day? Everything's kind of drab, dreary, a little grayish. So what's missing when you have gray? Well, it tends to be what we call the warm colors, the reds and the yellows. So it's throwing in a little red and yellow. Mm -hmm. um, some modes, it adds more contrast. Um, it, it just isn't making these tweaks. And if it gets it right, that's great. But I tend to feel the way Ian does it. But it's not what I want. And there are too many to choose from. And that's where you go into a little bit later in one of the programs. Those are pretty things that we um, The iPhone is really good when Hurricane uh, Sandy came through. Time Magazine sent the photographers out with iPhones and even the cover of the shot. And that's a print. So that's pretty darn good. There is a Nokia with a monster phone. Isn't it? The Nokias, the new Windows Nokia phones are nice. Tim's got a question from Morocco. Okay. Um, Tim's Can we go question. There to answer it? Yes, easily. Uh, Tim's question is: a lot of these phones, and this is sort of what I brought up, have scenes or modes. Mm -hmm. And the new phone that I just got now it has like it tries to be smart and has scenes. Is there a benefit to just going manual and doing what you said and saying, okay, tap for focus and worry about light and just try and figure out what the phone can do, as opposed to specific scenes that will say night mode or golf mode or stuff like that? Good question. My phone doesn't have any of that. So the tapping is just taking what's there. Yep. And I mean, it's, it's going to take the picture, and it's going to choose something to focus on and something to expose for. And I'm just telling you. So I'm not even shifting modes. My phone doesn't have any of that. Um, what I like to tell people about the modes is it's really a personal choice. Mm -hmm. If you find that the pictures look better for your eye in a certain way, um, then there's probably nothing wrong with it. Yeah. So let's say you're outside and it's a cloudy day and everything's drab and dreary. You're walking, you know, down the streets of Fez and it's just been raining and it's kind of drab, even for all the colorful things in Morocco. Well, maybe you'll put it on that setting and it'll make the color boost them a little. Yeah. Is it absolutely accurate and natural? Probably not, but how do we know what's exactly right? Yeah. So if it works for you, that's fine. One of the things that's worth understanding a bit 
is a little bit about how your phone records an image. So it records data. It, it, it sees the light. And I won't even bother doing all of what it does, because actually what it does is pretty similar to start. It records just the intensity of light. And it has this data. And you can't see it, but it's data. How bright is the light over there and what color? Each of those up. That's basically what it does. Each pixel, what color is it and how bright is it? Is it? And that puts it together. And then it is a processor in the camera. And that's how it processes it to an image we can see. Well, most cameras, most digital DSLRs, actually have settings. You can tell it what, what color the light should be, or it has a processor that's figured out. The data doesn't know what color it is. Um, we control it. So when we work with our images and work with a high level professional image, we actually work with the raw data. So all of this business about the color, all the stuff that you see through that, I would never put it in there. It's actually not in there in my case. Yeah. I can put it in later. When you have a JPEG, which is the format we all know, that's a produced, that's a process then, and it's been put in there. So even your non seeing image has some predetermined amount of lightening, darkening, color balancing, sharpening. Some of that's happened. It's already, already processed in there. And I think it goes back to what we said earlier, play. play you right. know, and in most of these phones and these cameras have gigantic SD cards. You mm -hmm. can take tons of photos, you know, play, see what works for you, go back later. Um, you know, yeah. you can process later. So, so what do the different, like, we have to GIS, JPEG, what are the different photograph files? Okay, good question. Good question. Um, if you had a professional DSLR, it would produce, it could produce a raw image, and that's the one that's pure data. The phones won't do that. The typical uh, file you'll see is a JPEG. A GIF file um, is it's a different story. It's not really used here. JPEG is the typical and the most successful um, file for an image. It contains all the pixels. It's a compressed file, so it's smaller. Um, when you compress something, you lose a little bit, but not enough to worry about. You can often set cameras for different quality levels, which are different amounts of compression. So the more you compress the picture and make a smaller file, the more you lose. The, le the higher the le quality level, the less compression. Probably not a big difference in terms of, uh, it could be a little difference in terms of this space. But you're basically going to have a JPEG. You're typically going to do best if the camera has a setting to go to the highest quality setting. Those cases start with best. Uh, the other file format you'll probably see is TIFF, T-I-F-F. -F. Mm -hmm. And TIFF is a format that's not compressed, or usually not, but it's a compressible form. Um, its advantage is it, it has not lost some data by compressing, but it's much, much bigger. Does compressed mean the same as a zip file? When some you see a file can zip or um, want to zip it. Sort of it, that, it, that it's figuring out ways to make it smaller and make notes so it knows how to make it bigger again. So it would, you know, and is some of the quality compromised? Like well, think about this. If you listen to a record, an LP, on a record player, you know, some people say you hear it differently or it sounds differently than like a an MP3 file is compressed. So. Does that MP3 file you get from iTunes or even listen to a CD? Some people say, well, it doesn't have as much like warmth, you know, um, as the, the it record. It changes. It. You know, mm -hmm. compression always, technically, always causes some loss. How much, and is it at the point that it matters? That's a big question. Um, there are several other factors that involve settings on cameras that allow that have more data or less data. Very often it doesn't matter. It matters if you've compressed it a lot. And it actually, there's one time it can matter. If you save it over itself, over and over. So you have a picture, you can't compress it. Now you want to go adjust it like I did on my computer. So it uncompresses it to do that. When I finish with it, I save it. But you know how like with a Word document you save it as you work along? Well, well if you did this with a JPEG, with a Word document, it doesn't matter. The JPEG, each time you compress it, you're throwing away a few pixels. So if you did that 15 or 20 times while you're working on your picture, you're going to start probably start to see degradation. So one of the general rules of thumb is don't save it over itself, save it separately. So 
let's call the, the um, JPEG that came out of your camera um, version one, iteration one. That's your camera generation one. When I want to close it, if I save it over itself or save it separately, those will both be generation two. But when I want to close it again, let's say I do more work, I want to close it. I close it over itself, now I'm to generation three. But if I just give it a new name, I'm still going to be generation. So that is one thing I like doing very few. In fact, one of the things I like doing very few is take the first, the first generation pictures, make a backup copy, put it away, and work on it another time. That way you mess it up, you always have to do it. <laughs> and frankly, the pictures that come out of our cameras are not that big. You can buy yourself a $40 hard drive and have enough for 10 years. Um, you can always back it, which is basically what it's coming from. Well, it's not what the drives are sale, but when. Yeah, oh yeah. I have a question. Um, using this camera, trying to set some pictures off of the dark, it's uh, low light. Mm -hmm. What can you do to not that? No, that's a tough one. So what happens is when you take pictures in low light, um, it's harder for the camera to record them. Often, first of all, often very often in low light, there isn't as much contrast, so things tend to look flatter, and then the camera is kind of like trying to boost the dark areas, and that's when you get a picture of cat's eye with wax very speckled, right. and that's noise. Yeah. Um, and one mm -hmm. movement also. Oh, movement also. That's the shutter speed. Yes. So you have two problems, yeah, and that's very, very difficult. You know, when, when I said when people shot the cameras, they talk about megapixels, um, and that is a big selling point. But one of the things that was happening more and more in the professional cameras years ago was better performance in low light. And that's one area where the expensive cameras still are pretty amazing. My new camera, the 36 megapixels is nice. But what's really remarkable is I could go in the dark and you hardly know. And it's that feature. It's, I can show you pictures that I shot in the last year that 10 years ago I never would have even imagined for us. Five years ago. That's a dramatic history. And it's still moving along. Now, as it happens, it's still going down. So, for example, the iPhone 5 is better at that than the iPhone 4. And that sort of low to low light part is a little bit better at that. But one of the things that happens is when you go into low light, the camera boosts its sensitivity, and a side effect of that is the modeling, that ring, and this very slow shutter speed that makes things blur. So, the one thing you can do is, um, for blurriness, try not to photograph moving subjects. And remember, you're a moving subject. If I hold this, how steady is my hand? Put it down on something. Rest it. Plant it. Make sure it's in tripods. That will help you right there. The next thing, um, unless and until you have a camera that does better in low light, that's light. One of the things that's, that's kind of nice is we can introduce some pretty small light sources. In fact, something that I brought to show you. Um, while I'm getting my stuff, any other question? It's a really good question. Um, and a huge frustration. So there's really no setting. Not. No, one thing, well, we may have something that does feel what we call noise to a degree. One of the things you can do is if you want to learn some software program that removes noise and will add some charge, which sounds pretty important. But if you, know, you do have a certain amount of noise, um, the software can do a remarkable thing. I shot a picture at the school of the play, and I used a setting on an older camera that produced a tremendous amount of noise. So, you know, they didn't take notice of myself. I'm going to try it. I'm going to I mean, nobody knows a shot in the position. So, I mean, we really, the software is part of the process. It's not, it's not only there to manipulate, it actually is part of the development process. That camera, and all these cameras, you make. Uh, these files, knowing that you can get rid of that noise, it's just an artifact. We're looking for a camera for my daughter to take the turkey, and they have different. Uh, is there a term for the time between when it'll finish taking one picture and then go to another? In other words, oh, it seemed like it took a long time for several of the cameras. Now, is it um, take I mean, multiple pictures can take them in a sequence, or how long can you press the button? To take? Well, you press the button, take the picture, and then to reset. Oh, okay. so is there a term for well, that? We usually talk about um, how many frames per second. Right. Yes, right. But the other thing that is a factor is what they call shutter lag or delay. When you press the button, it takes a few moments to calculate the exposure to focus. The old, older points of cameras 
so slow that if you were walking, and I guess I was the one who was starting to move, you'd be out of the room by the time it I saved my coffee. I went to try to take a picture of the pigeon jumping off the wall just to see if I could. And I couldn't, couldn't find it. It was so slow. That's not better. Right. Yeah. Right. I've seen it on the iPad. Yeah. 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 It has this data and it has to write it to your memory bar. Right, and that's what takes time. That can take time, and there are two factors there. One is cards have different speeds. They're called classes in class 6, class 10. But even within a class, the class 10 can have differences up to 10 times. So class 10 is faster than class 6, but I have class 10 cards that I can use in my big camera, and class 10 cards that I can. Um, but we not only have how fast the card can use, and how fast is the camera write to the card. So cameras will have their own limits, cards will have their own limits. So you have several factors. You know. I just noticed when I was actually trying them, some, it was like, this is too long. And it was probably the right speed. You might, um, a fast card might do it. If you look at the cards, they'll either say, uh, have a number of megabytes per second, it could be 15 or 30, or now we have some that are over 100. Um, and then some of them use a different system where they just use Ten x, ten times, twenty times, three hundred times. Um, it's hard to correlate to like thirty megabytes per second, but the higher, the faster. But there will be a limit based on how fast the camera can actually do that. Like, so it's kind of like the pipeline. How much, how long it takes for that quantity to do it? Yeah, good. Uh, you mentioned it's important to take advantage of how high dynamic. Yeah, yeah, that's the issue. Yeah. So, I, what is that? Does it mean? Okay, I'm going to think that. That's a great question. So, you remember we saw the pictures, like the one up in the sky, the sun going in the dark. Um, so what do you do with part of it? Part of it is just the white. Right? Well, it literally takes multiple pictures and puts together the other parts of it. So it takes a picture, then exposes the right part correctly, the picture that exposes the dark part correctly, and selectively blends them. And there actually are some programs that do that in a dozen. And it's become a really popular form of photography. Um, I found it actually really frustrating because for those pictures that have been fun, you get to take a picture of everything that's perfect and they don't get real to me. But it's, it's a great picture. Yeah, I noticed that there's it's a HDR on or HDR off. Do you recommend playing with that or should it always be on? No, no you should choose one to put it on. Play with it. Because one of the things that will happen, let's say something's moving, right. um, it needs the pictures to be pretty matched. Right. So when these things first came out, your pictures had to be absolutely identical when you figured it out. Now it's smart enough to move a little bit or figure it out. Um, but you want to choose because you don't always want it. And the other side of it is one thing you're doing is it's reducing your contrast. So if we use the word contrast, contrast is like when light and dark are very different. Something is more contrasty, the darks are darker and the lights are lighter. And everything looks sharper and snappier. Um, high dynamic range is actually reduced to contrast because the picture where the sky was over the right and the building was dark was too contrast, too big of a between that and dark. So if you're using it, you could wind up in a normal situation where it actually makes the picture look really well and flat. Okay. But for the most part, the downside of doing that all the time is it's going to take a little longer because it's taking a couple of pictures and putting them together. Use it because in some cases might go. You can try it and see if you're getting the results if you prefer. Right. And then we know, like, looking up, um, yeah. an experiment. And what I would do is try a bunch of different things to try. So if you touch something that you know more, like the guy was talking about gallery opening, that would have been a mess because of his room. Right. Uh, but if I get in this room, yeah, we'll probably bring out a little more detail and the dark shadows on the desk and the bright lights. But okay. you know, we don't tend to notice contrast with our brains or computer. When we see, we actually take multiple pictures. So I can see you. I can see you get under the desk a little darker. I can see the details of the fluorescent lights. So I'm taking different pictures and streaming them so my brain is totally contrast. And it's adjusting. So I can adjust. You can be in a room that's dark and see a person over there. 
Wie muss er das sagen? Es gibt einen Moment, wo er das nicht sagt, dass er das nicht sagt. Und unsere Brains sind sehr, sehr sophisticated in Prozess. One of the things that's been a, a very big progress in cannabis is improvement in the stem of the brain. So one of the complaints against early group of cannabis was it did not produce any cell abuse in that. Anybody ever uh, a fan of Ansel Adams photos? Well, one of his claims thing is he brought out all those range of light in one of his books. The cells and the highlights and the shadows. He did this by choosing exposure carefully, even by developing the picture in certain ways and printing it in certain ways. And sort of maximizing that tone in white, pure white, pure black. Even film tends to be better than that. Today, digital is better. It actually produces more. And that's one thing that the Institute is doing. Because it actually will produce greater subtleties in harsher situations, like bright glare days. About a about bright day in snow, not that kind of thing. But if you kind of give high dynamic range, you'll get more. <coughs> so if you can throw subtleties in the brights and the dark, you sort of, we call it extending the tonal range, getting more tone. Um, one of the ways to think about looking at light is think about a black and white picture. One extreme you have pure white, the other extreme you have pure black, and everywhere in between you have shades of gray. Very light gray, a little less light, a little light, a little medium gray, so forth. Okay, what happens with any color? Red. The red and the shades of gray, right? You get lighter, lighter, you get pink. What if you make that pink really light? What happens to it? It's too light. And what about the other way? It starts to get very burgundy color, dark, dark, and richer burgundy. Eventually, it's black. So everything is a tonal ring. It may have a color in it, but it's somewhere between pure white and pure black. It may not have a color. Um, and what we strive to do is produce the range of tones that we need. So if I want to see your shirt, I don't want to see the tones in the color. You know what? Look at an ad or look at somebody's shirt. Your shirt's one color, right? If I look at it, I can point to some really dark areas and really bright areas. You can see that in my shirt. Because we see highlights and shadows. Our brains don't remember them. Look at an ad for a white shirt or a white dress. You'll notice that if it's, if it's pure white, it'll look like a cutout. But if you look at a picture of a really white shirt, there are a lot of folds and a few wrinkles that make it seem like it's three dimension. And that's the shadows in the bright areas. Um, so it's highlights and shadows. So that's what we want to see, those tones that we need to see in the rest. And digital cameras are really, really good today. They're good. That's one of the things you pay more money for. You pay for that more than you pay for pixel. My 36 megapixel camera was pretty expensive. The 36 megapixel was great, but it produces very, very subtle tones and it works in very, very low light. And that's very well. And it does all three well today. That's what it's actually about. Not just the money. So go in the market, everybody responds to megapixels. It's like horsepower in car, unless you're going to really do a long 140 miles an hour. You go all over. Also, it's it's a solid tool, but the question is, what is it really? Yeah. The other question is, like, what are you talking? Yeah, let's play. I wanted to say something um, sure. on what Bob said too. As you work on your projects for uh, online content construction, don't always Try to make things perfect. Remember, you're telling the story, and all of those different things you play with to develop the story you're trying to tell through your photos and your videos and everything. It's not just the words that you're going to use with your content. All of those things tell part of the story. You may want some things blurry. You may want some things to appear farther away or misshapen. Um, so all that. Consider all that as you're developing the story that you're trying to tell. It's about different fields as well as right. It's not just about data, it's about what it conveys. It's about the sense of being there, the emotion, the mood. That could be in the highlights of the shower, what's sharp. The guy in the gallery, I like this kind of movie. He was frozen. He just wasn't been right. It was just, you need a little movement. And one of the things I don't like about the overproduced pictures, too perfect is not. And I, I love really great chart, but you know, perfect in the right way. Um, but but I that guy that was in, whose hand was in motion, you could tell it was going like this. And I thought that was more sense of being there. And if it froze it and he was like, yeah. you wouldn't know what he was, you know, so that does add almost a, a motion quality. Yeah. 
I had a, a, a very interesting experience years ago. Um, my work has always been very realistic. Once in a while, I go my brain goes wandering. And I came and started working with some abstract pictures, but unmanipulated abstract. And I was photographing underwater, and I was doing that to a camera test. Um, I was in the Caribbean. And I started to look up, and I took a look and I'm cool through the water. I was very shallow water, and the waves are breaking over me. So I took out my good camera, and I shot some pictures through the wave. And you know, when waves come along, you know, the water ends it. And I had this really cool series of pictures of the turf, the beach, and the palm tree that bend over, and the clouds are twisting into the water. You can see what they are. And I really like them. And I put them away, and then when they had to I have enough real uh, reels in my life. And I started exhibiting them. Oh, it's crazy. And a woman came in who was an underwater archaeologist and art teacher. And I wasn't there. And she looked at me and said, that's what it's like to be there. Which is one of my favorite compliments ever. But it's, well, OK, how many people like Monet? Hey, okay, like water lilies? Why, they're out of focus. Think about it. If I showed you a sharp photograph of water lilies, and I showed you Monet's water lilies, it feels more like water it doesn't look more like a water lily, but it feels more like a water lily. I love it. I think what it works is phenomenal. Yeah, you go to the Louvre and they're not there. <laughs> no, they're in the um, uh, Dorset. They had uh, pictures. Yeah, and it's a case status. And it's a very clear. Like, much more clear than that. Well, he chose carefully. He said you have to watch the light 24 hours before you change it. And you've got to get it all in. So he's on to the point of this. He's going to be down the road. 24 hours of life. And there's that sense of, yeah, there's yeah. Yeah. I think the world is great. You ever seen these huge ones? Wrap around? Yeah. Oh, they're I think they're in the museum where so this means other museum. You have to sit there and just have them. But they feel better. Nice picture of world is very nice. But it doesn't feel like the world. These pictures feel like them. Um, and, and so there is that, and then that, I think, was that was talking about. What do you feel when you see the picture? What do you get? What kind of mood? You know, what kind of your product? Um, and if you look at a lot of wonderful photographs, documentary, journalism, they're not all perfect. Sometimes they're using the action photos. Sometimes they're using the perfect light. Is it? Sometimes it's about the highlights and the shadows. Sometimes it's about a little bit of motion. Sometimes it's even a little bit of off angle. Um, perfection is not going to do it. It's not going to but explore. This is the only thing is choose carefully. Don't just say, oh, that's that focus. That means it's hard. Um, <laughs> I have students like that. Yeah, yeah, it does yeah. happen. <laughs> I did that on purpose. Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, so, I was very, very, very on the left. Because that's being a market. I know. Tasso did this very, very realistic work at the very beginning. He said he would do all this work and it was realistic and perfect. He spent the rest of his life trying to go out and try to do it. And he was out. So, choice. First of all, put your iPhone in here and you get wet. It actually, it's perfectly, but I think it's in the water. It works. You just put your iPhone in. Oh. So, you can go out in the rain without wrecking it. Dip it in water. Um, I was on a project recently, and we actually didn't do it with the iPhone. We did it $5,000 no, $5, camera in a simple house and just drop it in the water so you get a few different angles. Um, very cool. So, at least, this is actually free from Verizon. Uh, let's see what's going on here. Let's see This is the big camera. Do you have a tire on your phone? So, oh, first, the coolest thing is a set of lenses. So, this little bag has three lenses in it. my iPhone. They're on Amazon, they're everywhere. This came from Groupon at their places. So instead of $15, it's a price. And they come in two forms. Um, I like the clip on version, so you can basically take one of the lenses, which I this, and I screw it into this little base. Put it step off, and put it right over. Yeah, those are cool. And, and they're cheap. And what are they called? It's just called a lens pack for an iPhone. Um, they're like little macro lenses? or for ma the macro, there's a wide angle, there's a fisheye. Um, just look at like lenses for iPhones. 
They're, you'll see these red ones. They're pretty common. They're different brands. And they come in two forms, one with a clip and one with a magnetic base. We have to, you, the magnets have like a stick thing you put on your phone. I don't like the magnetic ones because they're permanent on the phone and then you put it on the outside of your case or inside. Now, by putting it on the outside of my case with a clip, I get a little bit of an edge because it pushes it away, but not enough to bother me. Camera on here. And here's what it's doing. Oh, that's the, <laughs> that's the uh, fish eye light. Fish eye. Now, there's an app right on the iPad that does that with any picture. It'll, uh, this, <laughs> is that's true. True. Um, this is actually the optic And by the way, this is actually reminded me of something important. Um, when you zoom in, if you ever had to a point your camera, They'll sometimes say optical zoom versus electronic zoom. Optical zoom means really doing it. The lens is doing it. Electronic zoom means it's cropping. And basically, it's throwing away some pixels. So yeah, you can do that yourself. You don't need a you know, camera. You can just go with your floor phone and just do that part. But optical zooming actually does it and uses all your pixels, all the data. Um, so it's generally better. This little thing is it's actually three lenses. This one comes apart. So it has a macro close-up, so that's how I did my fingerprints. It has a wide-angle one, so it's a little wider than the camera. I can fish out the most. You know, you get really silly with people like that. <laughs> and I mean, I, you know, I didn't show you the really tacky one, but I flipped it around the other way, point for your nose know, or something. But it's great fun. And you want to engage kids, they're going to love that, right? So this is my favorite tool. And like I said, it's like $15. Um, it's on every website. I think even some stores carry it. But shop it around. I mean, some will charge you a little more shipping, but you should get away for $15 at the most. I like to have a clip on one, and this one comes apart, and there are two different lenses the macro and the wider angle. Um, and there are different brands. I, this is the one I know, and I know it's pretty good. You'll find other brands out there, so try others. There also are, by the way, some very expensive ones, or moderately expensive. There's even an adapter to put these lenses on. There's a little magnetic new lenses for wildlife, and you can do that. But there are all sorts of different levels. But since I was playing, I didn't want to go out and spend a few hundred dollar experiment. But twelve dollars and pretty okay. Yeah. And I I'm pretty impressed. Optically, maybe the other one's better. Was it enough to know it's a picture okay? If I was going to print them and put them on the cover of Smithsonian, maybe that did a pretty good job. So other choice. Um, one thing I don't have that's really nice is they make little clips or clamps that make allow you to put this on a tripod. So you can use it in a lot of ways, and they're these very small tripods. So there are these little lightweight tripods, which are really not very good for cameras like that. But I've never had open. Years. Um, you have one back there, you? Yeah, the little. You have the uh, the little gorilla pod. The gorilla pods. Yeah. So this one folds up flat. So I can put my camera on it. They have bigger and bigger ones of those. Mm -hmm. Show you one. Did I show you the Velcro one, Ian? No, there's a not, not Craigslist. There's another website. There's one I found the other day. There's a couple other really good ones that are cheap electronic equipment. Most most times I just go to Amazon right away and start searching. But also, you know what? eBay has a lot that are actually directly shipped from China at free shipping. So they get there. Yeah. This is an example of a. This is like two hundred dollars. A heavy, fancy one. But if you're doing that camera, that's pretty neat. It's not this one I love because. I think this one's great. You have the tripod, but I can also go up to a lamp post and wrap it around it and it'll stick to it. So I can tie this to, and I've used it many times that way. It's actually really, you know, wrap it around, tie it itself, and, and I now use it for. your cat. There you go. <laughs> so that I want to go for. That I want to go for. My friend did it too. Here's the big version. Um, and the other thing that I do with it is you can put a light on. So if I want to take my pictures but I don't have enough light, maybe it's a smaller than I can take an LED light, put it on there, 
and the product comes out. So don't hesitate to use other lights. This one is a, is a video one. This one's a little bit less expensive, but I have a little headlamp that I've used that worked just fine. So don't hesitate to use some of those small LED lights that are inexpensive and fairly bright. Um, you have light coming in the window, but there's a shadow. Use a white cardboard that will reflect it. Darth, have you ever seen um, fashion photographers with these reflectors? They're incredible. They will push a lot of light back into a subject. Um, small one. It's not a great thing, but I actually found this in Swan a few occasions. Turns into a bit of a reflector, so if I have a bright light, I don't know if it's a good work, but you can see the difference in my face. You will move it if I can get it just right. Mm -hmm. So the shadows get a little light. It feels like a little light in there. So, you know, if you're standing in the window and the light's on the wrong side, put it there. It's a, it's a regular photographic technique. You can use a white piece of cardboard, you can see aluminum foil stretched over um, this cardboard. Um, aluminum foil is a partial light, white paper is softer than that. Um, those are great tools. So even this one, which is special, is probably about ten dollars. I didn't pay for we get little clip-on things, and I added a little attachment here. So if I had a tripod screw on there or my light, I can attach that and put it somewhere. Um, I can mean, get all sorts of little attachments like that. Just think about you know what will make life easier. Put your camera onto something. Um, these little tripods are still mine. Um, I love wrapping around my legs. Actually, you can do that with those. If you want long legs, they'll wrap around. But I like the little Velcro. Isn't that cool? Piece. Friend gave me one once, and this was long before little cameras and stuff. You do that, the cameras don't work. Yeah. Then I realized, no, but the lights sit on them. Yeah. And I would walk around and take a flash, or even a big flash, and wrap around the pole, and they didn't have to lights on them. So these are very cool. Um, and we used to get them from things like LLD for a few dollars, and then the camera store started trying them in the price of it. You have to buy stuff from the camera store that you can buy somewhere else. <laughs> Um, let's see what else do we have? If you want to evaluate the picture, especially if you're outside and the lights break, some kind of magnifier makes all the difference. This is unbelievable. This is a pretty professional one, but you can get what's the point there, it's dark. And a little bit of magnifier, you'll see all your details. Um, that really helps. I use it on that camera, and I use it on the phone. I feel like I do that every day just to look at Because like my phone's got a nice size screen, but my kids come at me with their little iPhones to look at a picture, and I'm like, and that was three pair of glasses on. Oh, yeah. This. <laughs> no, this is good. I, I was just working on, especially with bright light, I was working on a project for two weeks um, in the Bahamas a few weeks ago. And it was really, really intense light. And that's a really good all the time. Right. Instant gratification, I know what I did. So recommend stuff like that. Here's another thing. There's no special name for that. This is called a hood name. It's a company that makes it H O O D M A N. I don't know what that is. Um, you put it on the back of the camera. Right on, on the screen. So whether it's on the back of the camera or if I call it a picture on here, it's on my phone. Yeah. Right. It's basically shutting out the ambient light and you can look right at your pic. Right. So, you know, if I want to look that, I can go like this. And it shuts out the, the bright light, which makes it easier to see the picture. What the bright light does is it makes everything lighter. So things that are light become too light, that's why you can see it. The things that are dark become lighter and you don't see any sharpness. So it puts it makes it bigger and darker. And that's what you see. So it's a great good tool. You can do that. You can make any kind of thing that keeps the light out and puts the magnifier on that. Um, headlamps are great. Uh, yeah, this is a yeah, bright one. I think we can do this. And it's pretty bright, so I can put it on the air and put it over there. The air will light. But I think the most important thing is some kind of way to mount your pic your camera, setting it just like you were doing with the cam before. Yep. Um, get invented. Play. Play with that done made out of wood. Um, but one thing I don't have is I don't I actually use bungee cords on the attaches. Camera's up there, so I can bungee this. Mm -hmm. I went under the water with um, a galaxy tablet in one of these plastic cases, bungee to it this camera in one of the $65 price of case that I tested at the time. Um, they all work really, really well. Um, is it as good as a regular housing? No, but it's really small and light and convenient. Um, so, bungee cords, the bungee cords and velcro cords are 
two of my favorite toys. I think it's just that trust factor. I mean, it's like the iPad. It's a six hundred dollar piece of glass. You know, some of these Ziploc bags. Yeah, you just want to be careful. I mean, you know? I knew that the bag that I got was pretty yeah. decent. I tested it. I know somebody used one, and it was still a risk. I mean, if, if I was really going to do that a lot, I would make sure. But I mean, you're going underwater to take the very shallow. You know, but it's still. But yeah, so, <laughs> yeah, definitely that water. But check it out. Monopod. It's a single pole. Right. Well, uh, this is the way it works. So, when you hold your hand steady, well, it's not pushing. So you have a certain amount of movement. Try to hold something. We're going to have a little bit of movement. The tripod is totally independent. It stops the movement. Assuming the floor is not moving and it's solid. What monopod lets you do is you push down on it a bit, and while you can still move like this, the vibration. And the vibration is a real problem. So, the monopod think does two things. One is it can make you stick. It's not steady like a tripod. So if you are going to get movement like this, you know, you still going to get movement. But the vibration movement, which is usually the first movement to show, that will go away. It will make you much, much steadier. Push down on it. The other thing it does is it makes you stop and feel a little more deliberate. You ever notice when you're taking a picture, maybe with a lot of people pushing? You tend to think more when you have something that you're stopping. I get more deliberate. But yeah, it will help you. It's not the same as a tripod, but it does provide advantage. And if you do the video, one of these will do is keep you level. So if you were to try to pan, you kind of want to go up and down a little bit, that would be kind of key. You can get to transition to your movement too. Because then we already talked about video. But if you try to do video, you know this, you can see some movement. And all these techniques you can have some vibration and reduction in it. But the monopod will quite like proud keep your hand. Is that Anywhere. Yeah, anywhere. Anywhere you need a little more steadiness. Or smooth. Absolutely. No, actually, a lot of them have rubber tips. Some of them, the rubber tips screw back and a little point is going to come out. So you might not want to do that on a hardwood floor if you don't like it. But, you know, if you do that outside the turf, that's fine. Inside, you make sure the rubber tips. So that's the way the rubber tips can get back in the back. But you don't need that much. Tripod, actually, good tripods are the same thing on this type. You can use these places where that would be a good question. Yeah, but anything that stabilizes, actually, frankly, you can stabilize yourself just by leaning against the wall. I mean, I've taken pictures where okay, I'm moving, but if I press this against the wall here, um, the wall, well, a lot of movement's gone away. I can still move like that, but I can get a lot steadier. And that will show them. It works with that camera, it works with this camera. The table works. I use cameras like this, and you know what works really well for these things? As long as it's clear, that's perfect. Or I can buy one that for $100 that I can sand in. I just do my job, trying to fill the Really true. Um, so anything that makes it safe, think about it. You know, where you need to do it. If it's very windy, the wind is making you walk Rest it on something. Press it down. Be careful though when you take when you stand on something, you don't really wait to take pictures of things. But you can get a lot of stability just by holding your hand something and trying to hold yourself steady. If you hold your hand out like this, it's gonna be hard to steady. Rest it. Mm -hmm. You can get really kids. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's so like tucking your elbows in helps you to steady. Because I find that so many times I go over to take a picture and my hand is sleeping. Yeah. Yeah. And especially if you tuck your elbows in, that helps steady. Oh, absolutely. In fact, I saw a Groupon for a, a camera course and it shows that holding a camera like this. Can you try to hold this heavy camera like this? Yes. I can do it. First thing I was taught in photography, pushing down and the more I push, the steady area. And the difference between this and trying to do this is huge. And the more you're zoomed in on something, more of your magnification. Your emotions magnify. So this is first thing. And this works. And actually the lighter cameras are harder to say like that because you don't have to wait behind it. So here you might want to do this if you know if you're in, if you're in vibration. Right. If you have a moving train at some point. Um, one of the things that actually uh, to affect photography is heavy vibrations, one by a jackhammer or trucks or buses or somebody in New York. 
So that's vibration that's transmitted too. But think about the segments. You know, they're mostly water. So we're kind of switching. Um, and we tend to just hold the things. And really, it's hard when you're playing the idea. Yeah, no, it really is. <laughs> yeah, try holding a glass of water. Yeah. Hold it like this, and then hold it like this. And it'll get better. It'll get better. Oh, a lot of the things are really simple. And they don't tell you these things. And they don't tell you about simple toys and tools. It's great. I, I did one of my early projects. I got me to use one of the old Dollars and Life magazine. Not one of the most famous ones, but it's been around. So I wound up, uh, yeah. both, I had an idea for a project. She was from France, and I was going to spend some time working for a while over there. But we wound up working together. And he had worked in the days of life magazine when money was no longer. And that was one of the real things for him. All the toys, all the equipment, you know, you need another chauffeur car, sure. And the money was not incredible. And I had this equipment that this other photographer taught me how to gather a bird. And this guy just explained the entire time about his gun. Home. Oh, your own choice. You want to go to the place. You were older than one of the that I brought mine. Um, you sure used it for the five years you were. You were like, oh, I'm not going to go to the five years. Very nice match. But it wasn't, you know, it wasn't fancy enough for him. Maybe it wasn't a good choice. So some people need a little and uh, I think sometimes you need it. This item is really good. It's expensive. It's really good quality glass. Okay, you can't fake that. But I can fake the car product, the camera bag under there. I don't need, you know, a special bag. So, you know, teach your mom? Uh, you may teach the photography and photojournalism. So, just, you know, go experiment. It's a really long idea. One day I worked with a student, the one who was on the airplane just went on this project at the bombs. Who loves to go to the So you see stuff to go the video thing. And it's really great stuff. Mm -hmm. So yeah. try things. And the nice thing is your phones and your tablets are smaller, lighter. Um, just get creative. That's a great way to stay in the room. Do you take a picture on the camera? You've got a tripod there. Your tablet. Um. So you know, just use yeah, and use the toys. Move a lamp around. Uh, use a reflector. Uh, just, just experiment. And but the, in terms of learning, I will say, do some deliberate experimenting. So like the cat in the window, take a bunch of pictures. Have somebody stand there. Cat's hard to get to stand still. You find a person who will cooperate. You know, I have my students do for a lighting lesson. I have a little window. Turn out the lights in the room and take a picture. And make me stand there and turn my head this way. This way, this way, this way, that way. And you stand here, 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 and see what happens. And I have a big series of pictures I show them because I took an arm. And I have a light. And I show the camera on the tripod here, 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 here. And then at an angle and closer and further. And you see the change. It changes the shadow. So you have to turn on the light in the room. If the room is pretty dark and lights are shooting in the window, and you hold up a white card or a light figure, shadows will get lighter. Do it a couple times. And you'll, you'll, I will remember, your mind will remember. Um, and your pictures will get better. And think about that composition. Think about what the whole picture should look like. Is it in the center or off to the side? You know, what, what else in there? Is there a tree growing out of somebody's head? Um, what looks right? What's wrong? Color. Something very bright against something very bright is not going to be as well as something very bright against something dark. Um, so think about that. It can you still clear it? Um, when you move over a little bit, and you put the darkest thing against the lighter. That makes you huge. And you can have some side fill. Mm -hmm. Did you ever say this woman? Mm -hmm. And they show her in a certain light, in a certain angle, which is really pretty. And then the next time you see her, it's an intruder, and like, she's scary looking. <laughs> no, 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 no. 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 She's in Monet. She looks like a Good from far, but far from good. Yeah. Okay. Okay. She's a Monet, good from far, but far from good. <laughs> that's good, I made that one. Yeah, well, it's, but it's, it's really about the light. There was a photographer who uh, worked with the when um, there was a woman who uh, worked around, showed it around Broadway, and then the dancer, and she took some pictures. And she actually had done this series on bad things, but she wasn't, I had no technical skills. 
And I'm doing one of the editors at the party, which is trying to do so good. My friend decided he was going to help her. He wanted to make a little more money out of the dancing wasn't going so great. Um, and he taught her some writing through corporates and headshots. He never really got technical, just visited a couple of lights and showed her ways to look. Her picture, her portraits, were the best I've seen. Even with, she never became famous, really famous. She still had a second day. But she made everyone individual. She looked at the light. She was looking at the view. And I'm choosing to be part of the headshot she had done for the up and coming for Spider Man first. Everyone was different. She didn't use a matrix. She didn't use a you know, template. She just looked at and working simply with two lights. Um, so it's just a matter of her taking that kind of control. It was amazing. In fact, you could never do anything technical. She called me inside the same time. And she's great. She's just great. And she's still at it. And her, in fact, there's some very, very prominent part of it. I want her to do my work, but she does a really nice job. Because it wasn't the cookie jar. So, you know, play around with the light and see what works. See what happens when you make a shadow or when you get rid of a shadow. And you turn your head in different ways. And then you check to know, put the head in different ways. Put the portrait technique like this and bring the eyes down. Different people look in different ways. Also, if they're comfortable with you. An object. Um, anybody ever take your kids on the ground on the floor or their pets? Mm -hmm. Well, you stand up, you look better when you get down to their level. Oh, wow. I was Cranking out these chip pictures of people who love. All I did was crawl around on the floor with them and put some indirect lights and just get to see the world the way they see it. And so just don't hesitate to stand on something. And the cool thing with this is you can hold it up here and see what's happening. I can shoot a picture of the crowd and just put it on the front. So experiment. Apparently. They're also more wireless and they have a wireless part of this, so I can transmit things from this to my pad and see everything's going on and even focus it. Um, so <laughs> and what's scary is it's not that expensive. Yeah, good. They don't need to. Yeah, I can literally put the package to the bag. That's for sure. It's like that. Yeah, so you have a USB, and I have an app on my phone on my tablet, and you can go, you see, I do like this. So I can look here and focus it. Darker, and there's even an attack for a motorized car. Um, Some of the wearable stuff that's coming out, they'll have for like your Android. The Android watches, you can control the camera app from your watch, so you can take a picture. And I mean, this is what's so great about like computational photography is people. The, the app, the the watch was launched like two weeks ago, and then the app was built like two days ago. And somebody said, "Well, that stinks. You should be able to see." what your camera is seeing on your cell phone before you want to take a picture so you can focus there and take the picture. So the developer's like, okay, done. So now you look at it and you can see. I mean, this thing's been around for two days and somebody complains. You can see what your cell phone is looking at and then be like what he said before. Oh, I want to take that photo. So you can basically leave your camera wherever you want and just take little cell phone shots. And you know? shoots have all this stuff built in. Yeah. That's amazing. <laughs> It's crazy. It, it is crazy. It is crazy. So, um, I have a question. Um, sure. In an attempt to support my own auditory learning style, mm -hmm. I've been taking the whole conversation today. I'm glad here. Is it okay? I guess you should ask before. Well, I what, can delete it now. No, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the video and take the audio and you know and just put it all together because I mean Tim right now is watching in Morocco, but I think that at a later date we want to go back and say, okay, I want to get this one part. We'll well, you dropped a lot of great tips. So, so as long as I don't have to look at pictures of myself or give myself a memory. <laughs> my students know that they're going to do it. So as long as you have to see me, if you're, if you're comfortable with it, it doesn't give you nightmares, go for it. But, uh, no, but thank you for asking. Because I was loving the conversation earlier about copyright. Thanks for being mixed to that. I'm not going to be that big. Ethically, it's nice. It really doesn't. Really? It's worth that. Yeah, it's one place. Most what does that mean, one party state? Whether one party of a conversation, and it needs to be on the phone number two, is aware of the tape, or two parties, both parties have to. So, for example, if you were taking a call,